So now it is my great pleasure, honor to uh, introduce Sarah Watamora. So Sarah Watamora is professor and chair of the psychology department at the University of Denver, uh, where she directs the Child Health and Development Lab and co-directs the Stress Early Experience and Development, which is called the SEED Research Center. She has longstanding interests in children's physiologic regulation, their development within caregiving contexts, and in understanding mechanisms and trajectories from early life stress to later physical health, mental health, cognitive, educational, and socio-emotional outcomes. Her work focuses on the unique stressors and buffers in families experiencing poverty and among newly immigrated and refugee families and includes testing promising intervention approaches. Recent projects test and develop interventions to support families facing adversity, including those that target the well being of the adults and children's lives who themselves may have history of adversity. I have had the opportunity to hear Dr. Watamora speak a couple of times at national meetings with the National Alliance of Children's Trust and Prevention Funds, now the Children's Trust Fund Alliance, um, and have been really impressed with how she translated translates what I think is pretty complicated science into. Uh, understandable um, pieces and even more importantly makes it practical and helps us understand how we can use that in the interventions and their prevention work. So without further ado, I will introduce Sarah Watamora. Thank you for uh, being part of this uh, Strengthening Families Training Institute from Denver. Absolutely, Roger. Thank you for the kind introduction and good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> it is not spring here at all. We got a um, a lot of snow last day, the last couple of days, almost uh, three feet. So um, we are digging our way out and thinking about those uh, beautiful flowers and turning the corner. Um, I think a lot of us are thinking about turning the corner um, more broadly and what, what the next chapter is gonna look like for ourselves and also for the children and families that we work with. Um, I'm assuming I should just <clears throat> redo my screen share here. So I'm gonna do that. And uh, what we're gonna talk about today is how we move past being trauma-informed and try to think about the work that we're doing in a broader framework. Um, so before I do that, I just wanna give you a little history on why I, uh, why I selected this topic and um, uh, why Rogers heard me um, talk before in this kind of a context. And essentially it is, <clears throat> so, I am an adversity researcher. I've studied adversity since you know I was in my early twenties, um, and it it is a compelling, you know, deep, broad scientific base. We know a lot about how stress and adversity impact the way your brain grows, the way your body develops, the way your relationships develop. Um, but we put in that frame a lot of focus on the individual and on the individual family. And <clears throat> we lose sight of the fact that, um, you know, nothing happens to any of us in a vacuum. And we have, in, in recent years, we've done a much better job of helping people understand what is trauma, what does trauma-informed mean, um, a lot of kind of educational um, workshops, that kind of thing. And I have participated in many, many such things. I've gone, you know, sort of all over the country, in fact, uh, all around the world, trying to help people understand these concepts. And I think that is really important, um, but it gives, it, it makes it possible to put a separation between the information and the experience when you just learn about it in a context where you're sitting in a chair and, you know, thinking about maybe how this type of thing might affect other people, right? Not you. Um, and I think we, we really have a lot more work to do in terms of understanding that all of us are the product of, you know, so many things that have happened in our own lives and in our own worlds and in our own families um, in a particular place and time. And that what we do with that is complicated. Um, and trying to just take a broader perspective on that not only because it's, it's more accurate and it, and it builds better empathy, but I think it is more effective. I think we are more effective at helping people change their trajectories if we take a view that includes an understanding of how a person might develop in a context um, that, is, that is full of signals that the world itself is unstable and threatening. Um, so when a, when a child is born, 
and raised in an environment that communicates to them that the world is unstable and resources are scarce and threats come from all over the place. The way they develop their brain and body is different. Uh, it isn't bad, it's adaptive, it's, it's successful, um, but it doesn't help to just sort of focus on this is a maladaptive adaptation pattern, which tends to be the way we talk about it. It, it actually helps to understand the pieces of it, the strengths of it, and that's what I'm hoping um, we can do together today. All right, let's see if this is going to let me advance here. So far, there we go. Okay, um, Roger mentioned, but I just wanted to highlight, I'm part of a, a, a big research group, the Stress Early Experience and Development uh, Research Center. I have the pleasure of working with these amazing scientists um, all the time who really look at the effects of early experiences starting in uh, during pregnancy. So that's uh, the two on the far left. These are kind of organized in, in order of development. So Angela and Alicia both uh, primarily work in the, in the pregnancy period. Um, all the way up through adolescence. So infancy, early childhood, middle childhood, as you go along, uh, Jenna does a lot of stuff in middle childhood, adolescence, and then back around to how our histories impact who we are um, when we enter adulthood and, and start to think about being parents again, uh, uh, you know, parents of the next generation. Um, so what I wanted to talk about a little bit is I, I gave you kind of the high level, but this is, we're going to just kind of follow along so you can see where you are. So I'll have a little outline to track us as we go here. So starting with ecologic systems, you guys are probably all familiar um, with this type of uh, a rubric, which is that the individual is situated within uh, a complex layered system. But we tend to forget about this when we think about our leverage points or our places for action tend to think about our ability to impact individuals or impact families. Um, and maybe, maybe some of us work on systems change, um, but actually it's the case that most of us can work at multiple levels. Um, we can matter, I saw in the chat or in the early, right? We can matter for that person in the grocery store that is just totally so frustrated that they cannot function, right? we can just approach that person and say, hey, why don't you give me your list? I, I did that just a couple of weeks ago. I was like, why don't you give me your list and I'll run around the store for you. And, you know, just take a minute and, and get a breath. We've all been there, right? Like you can, any of us can do that. Um, we can, many of us can work on implementing or developing um, supports and programs for families. Um, we all are part of workplaces and schools and you know cultural groups and religious organizations where we can impact the way things are done, the way people treat each other, the way they talk to each other. Um, and all of those systems intersect. We can, uh, we can participate in school board and local elections, um, local government being so important alongside participating in state and federal government uh, initiatives. So there really are ways we can all contribute across, um, across these systems. And sometimes when a problem, you can't move forward on a problem in the system you're used to working on, you can, you can work on that problem another, another place. Um, and sometimes it's doing the work really just internally. Um, sometimes it's about just forgiving yourself or uh, putting something down and, and moving forward on your own. Um, all right, so there are a lot of different economic factors that impact families. So when we think about these different levels um, and the economic factors I wanted to highlight um, in particular, because they are, uh, they are always very pressing, they're often left out um, and they're particularly um, disparate right now in the time of COVID. Um, so we often talk about absolute income. So we ask, you know, what are you, what percentage of the poverty line are you at? Um, is a measure many people uh, take. And absolute income matters for sure. Um, but absolute income by itself doesn't tell you a lot about um, how, how, and we might even ask, you know, in a very, um, in a very nuclear family centric fashion, how many people are supported by that income, right? But we don't always ask about um, if any of that income is being sent overseas. We don't often ask about um, other ways that people are in networks and supporting each other. And so in my research, we, um, we do ask all of those types of questions 
And it helps explain the otherwise um, sometimes very surprising outcomes you can see where it seems like um, a family might be, you know, doing all right. And yet they have a ton of instability in their, in their food security, in their housing security. Um, and another family might seem like they really truly don't have much income, but it's actually fairly temporary and, and uh, mom's gone back to school and um, they have uh, a lot of community support. And so understanding income and context is really, really critical, especially um, when you're talking about income under the federal poverty line. Um, there's an enormous amount of resource inequity. Um, so everywhere that you are differs in terms of whether there's, um, what, how many safe free programs are there. And in fact, safe free programs tend to be more common in areas where families could afford programs that aren't free. Um, so uh, in the neighborhood where I live, there's all kinds of free activities for kids. There's a beautiful big park that's well maintained. There's a um, there's a rec center with a pool, right? We, we could afford to, to take our kids somewhere to do those things, right? Um, but it is just the way things are set up, right? The way property tax drives um, that, that what you have in terms of your uh, resource availability is, is simply just inequitable across um, different parts of the country within a city, different parts of a state. Um, in both directions. And so that isn't always to assume that, uh, that there are better resources in, in one or the other uh, context. Um, and then what about, what kind of opportunity is there, right? So when you're thinking about economics, you also need to think about economic mobility. So it's one thing to have a low absolute income and to have opportunity, right? There's a strong economy or new jobs, training opportunities, retraining opportunities, um, ways to think about uh, going back to school, um, changing, you know, something that just doesn't fit. And, and the, the flip of that, which is being in a situation where there's relatively little opportunity, where the, ind the primary industries have, um, have failed or closed. Um, so the way that that income manifests itself and, and matters has, has a, um, a temporal di dimension, right? So how stuck are you essentially? What kinds of changes could you make? What would be possible to do? Um, there are huge disparities in terms of wealth. So that's, that's how much, um, uh, not income, right? But in terms of assets, uh, huge disparities in wealth. Um, and those are actually much larger than disparities in income. Um, and those provide a, a cushion, a support, uh, a leverage, a different kind of set of constraints um, for families uh, to work with. And I mentioned the constraints piece because I think um, we sometimes overlook the way that uh, economic resources and wealth can, can make um, family dynamics that are problematic uh, very hard to surface. So being within a, uh, a high income, high wealth uh, family or neighborhood uh, in an abusive relationship um, with, uh, with child maltreatment is, is uh, a lot to give up, right? A lot to, a lot to walk away from, um, a different set of constraints that, that uh, children and families can be in. Um, and I think I sort of already alluded to this, but this stability or possibility for growth, which you can think of at the individual level and you can think of at the community level. So trying to, trying to this is just a, it, one of the easiest ways to think about how the, all of those different levels impact an individual um, child and family and um, the, the complexity that's, that's involved in that. Um, we also have social or structurally embedded in, inequities. And we tend to, we tend to think of um, some of the big the big ones that, that drive the way the world is built. So racism and sexism, we just talked about income and wealth. Um, we tend to forget how much of that is in the built, um, in the built environment and the way we've built our, in our societies. And that red line there, that circle um, is designed to remind me to tell you that um, uh, uh, banks and mortgage companies have the habit of drawing what's called a red line around a community that determines the possible uh, loan rates for everyone within that circle. Um, so it is constraining the possibility of change irrespective of the individual family's uh, possibilities. Um, it's called, it's literally called redlining. Um, and I was at a really interesting economic forum actually where they were talking about um, greenlining the red line 
and they were talking about greenlining the red line to make money, not because uh, not because it's the right thing to do, but they actually were in, in imagining, well, if we put a green line around a previously red line community, we would um, we would incentivize uh, new borrowers, and you know it was in the context of trying to think about economic stimulus. Um, so these types of things, it's not like you can see the red line, right? You can guess where it is. Um, these types of systemic things are are real, and they're they're things that are happening um, often outside of our outside of our awareness. And then when a change happens, so when a neighborhood, for example, becomes gentrified, um, like essentially you green line the red line, right? And then um, it becomes very incentivized, very attractive, very possible for people to move into that into that space. Um, they're building equity in that space. Um, and it makes it more difficult uh, for families who've been there a long time to stay. Um, there's also a lot of different interacting factors in terms of uh, how our relational or social factors are promotive or protective. So what is your individual or your group identity? Um, individual and group identity has a huge impact on trajectories. When we think about what is promotive or protective, why is it that one adult can turn the trajectory for an individual child. Um, it's one adult that that child thinks is consistently available to them. It's one adult who thinks that that child has a different possible trajectory, right? It is. It intersects with that child's perception of themselves and what's possible for them, uh, what kind of safety net they have. It isn't literally um, just the physical presence of an adult. Um, to what degree do we have uh, cohesion? Um, to what degree is this a family or a cultural group that identifies themselves as survivors, as strivers, um, as people who are good at problem solving, right? Or people are making good at making the, the most of, of not much. Um, trying to measure those types of things in a research context is tricky, but it actually can be really, really in, insightful as to why a particular family or child has such a negative outcome and another does not with what might seem like um, very similar uh, characteristics. Um, and then how much conflict, how, at, at what level are we experiencing conflict, right? Within the family is what we tend to focus on. That's what we all are talking about when we're talking about uh, maltreatment in particular, but how much conflict is, is happening to that family system in, the, in terms of ethnic, religious, racial, economic conflict, how much of the day are they spending in low grade conflict with every single thing? Um, and then trying to, trying to hold that and respond to that in some type of reasonable way and come home and uh, parent um, in that type of context. And then how much stability, right? How much stability has there been in the family? Um, COVID has really accentuated the degree to which, um, you know, physical health really impacts all of these other pieces. If somebody, or some multiple people in your family system uh, are ill um, or, or passed away, um, the, the ability of any of the building or, or striving or opportunity that we talked about previously to, to impact you is completely undermined when there is um, literal instability in the family. And the flip of that is, you know, family stability can be extremely powerful, right? So why is it that Families who who have dinner together every night, like that's one of the you know best promotive factors. Having dinner together every night is a is a promotive factor. Well, what makes it possible to have dinner together every night, right? Like it's making it a priority for sure, but it's also having the stability of of the folks um, that are there in order to do that. Um, nobody having to work two or four hours away, or you know more than that, having to live in a different place in order to make ends meet, that kind of thing. So, and then how things happen, how things are interpreted really, really depends on the time and place that you're in. And that is really important for understanding how you might wanna make an impact, make a change. Um, so these are, all, um, these are all factors that I think are even easier to understand in the context of, of COVID, right? So let's take the last one first. What is homeschooling? The answer to the question, what is homeschooling two years ago and what it is now is completely different, right? Homeschooling is normative at this point. Um, and, uh, and many people view it as temporary, but we sure all know what it means, right? We know what it means to try to teach kids at school, completely different meaning for 
uh, what it was um, just uh, you know 18 months ago, where the vast majority of families had no intention of trying to homeschool. Um, no, probably not a lot of graded understanding about what happens in a school day um, and trying to think about what that means. So what does it mean to be a family who homeschools right now as compared to 18 months ago? It's a completely different cultural meaning uh, than it was then. Um, spanking, right? Spanking, um, uh, spanking, corporal punishment, totally different impact if it is at a time and place in a cultural uh, framework where most families are using that type of discipline versus at a time and place where most families are not using that type of discipline. What does it mean to be a good parental monitor? I mean, how many times have you had the conversation or joked around with your friends about how like you never, uh, you know, you, you got the bus by yourself. You know, I rode the bus by myself when I was little and you know, walked home from school, stuff that kids don't do as much, right? Because now good parental monitoring doesn't look like that. Um, and it is in my case, not objectively true that it was safer in the neighborhood I was in as a kid than the neighborhood my kids are in. It's, that's actually objectively not true, but it would be so atypical right now for me to let my, I mean, I let my five and seven-year-olds ride their bikes around the block. And frequently someone will say like, oh, those kids are with you, right? Uh, just around the block in my, you know, very safe neighborhood. Um, so what does it mean to do these things right? It's really important that we remember that these are culturally embedded topics, right? Even something that is, might seem objectively clear, like hitting, it should never be okay to hit somebody. But spanking, spanking has a culturally embedded meaning and it has a place in time. So the impact, what the intention was of the behavior, what the consequence of the behavior matters for the time and place that you're in. Um, and then how common is something like single parenting or teen parenting, right? Being a parent under 19 for in many times and places was not at all atypical, was not at all a risk factor. <clears throat> Whereas right now, just the word teen parenting implies, right? Some, some inherent risk, like there is something about that that is gonna convey uh, some negative outcome. But it is, it is not, an objective characteristic of, um, of somebody who parents under the age of 19. It's, it is a culturally embedded thing and it has to do with the, how common the behavior is and how the behavior is viewed. So I think it's really important to take all these things in mind. Again, if our goal is to support the best outcome for children and families and we wanna change behavior, right? To get to that better outcome and you want someone who is doing something that is currently not culturally typical or not culturally typical in mainstream culture to change, you have to respect that the behavior itself isn't abhorrent. The behavior itself, in many cases, okay, there's, there are examples, but in many cases, the behavior itself had a common aspect at some prior time, um, maybe will at some future time, that we, that we have uh, stripped from its current meaning. So I think it's also really important to, to understand that, um, you know, I, and I think COVID has probably made this really clear to people, but um, there's not an, a good indication right now that the disparities within our country between people are decreasing. In fact, they are increasing. We are not making our society more equitable. We are making our society less equitable. And by making it less equitable, we impact the health, not only of people at the bottom, but of everyone in our society, it turns out it is not good for health to be in an equitable, uh, in an inequitable um, society. It just isn't. Uh, so these these graphs, you don't have to try to to figure this all out. But the bottom the bottom right one is just showing you that the increase across time in uh, economic um, disparity between the top uh, the top earners and the bottom earners in the country, and then the bigger graph with the pink bars is showing the, the incremental cost to health for each of those uh, disparities across time. And that only goes, it only goes to 99, but it actually is um, a continuing factor. So this is mortality, all-cause mortality data. And what you can see is the chance of all-cause mortality occurring, the difference between say the, the uh, darkest pink bar and the lightest pink bar is smaller in the 70s than it is in the 80s, than it is in the 90s. So the literal cost to mortality of being in an in inequitable society has increased across that time band at the same time that the inequity itself has increased. 
Um, and we see the impacts on health of these inequities very, very early. So we see them in the zero to three um, time range where you can already see impacts on health um, occurring uh, because of a, a disparate um, family income. And if you uh, aren't aware, the US is uh, an outlier. So we are all by ourselves here at the top of this graph and you see on the top, the top right there is the US in terms of um, the, the very strong relationship between income inequality and the overall index of health and social problems in a country. Uh, you can see that's a very, very strong relationship and the US is all the way at the top of that, of that graph. And what's great about this paper, which I would highly recommend reading, is that it's actually an experimental paper. So what they did is they looked at countries who changed their policies so that they changed their income inequality uh, guidance in one way or the other. So you can make income inequality more or less um, prevalent, for example, with uh, the way you handle your tax law is one, one way you could do that. There's lots of ways you could do it, but that's one way you could do it. Um, when countries have changed their income um, inequality across uh, people, um, their health and social problems index has tracked that. So it's gotten worse if they've made income less equitable and it's gotten better if they've made income more equitable. So that impacts the whole society, not just people at the bottom. Um, so an important, an important factor to keep in mind when we're thinking about these concentric rings and how a family is trying to function and what we're trying to change when there's a dynamic within a family that is, that is threatening to an individual child. All right, so we also know a lot about the costs of stress on, um, on the body. So um, you don't have to read this. I'm just, I'm gonna tell you what it means. Um, essentially, we have uh, now over 40 years of research to show that uh, stress and trauma um, make it more likely that you're gonna get sick. And if you get sick, they make your outcomes more problematic. So we call that susceptibility and progression of disease. That's definitely true for cardiovascular disease, diabetes and infectious illness. And it's also true for many types of cancer. It's also true for COVID. Um, some of how this happens, some of how stress impacts the body is by changing the risk of risk factors. So when, uh, when an illness comes or um, when you have a predisposition, a genetic predisposition, say for a particular uh, outcome, um, you, you have to hit a particular tipping point, right? So your average 20 year old is pretty healthy, 25 year old, 30, 35 year old, pretty healthy. Um, what tips that balance and takes you from a healthy state to an unhealthy state? Um, so there are a number of things that happen when a person is experiencing stress, adversity, and low resources repeatedly beginning in childhood. They change some of the set points in their body that make it more likely that they survive in the short run. And those adaptations also make it more likely that they get sick. So let's take obesity as an example. When you tell your body over and over and over again that you live in a low resource, high threat environment, um, so you're gonna need a lot of energy because threats come from wherever they come from, but your resources are unstable, right? You teach your body, you tell your body that it needs to hoard calories because calories are what we use for energy. You not only tell your body that it needs to hold on to its calories when it's got them, you tell it to pay attention to high caloric food sources, right? And you tell your body that it would be maybe a good idea to put some extra weight right around the middle. Um, so if you experience lots of stress and adversity, you're much more likely to have um, adipose tissue, fat tissue around the middle of the body. Um, I think of it kind of like a little life raft, you know? And uh, the, the rationale, like the biologic rationale there is that that fat that's stored has energy in it that you can get anywhere right? It can go up or down anywhere to your body when you need it, when there's no ready meal source. Um, over time, you're sending those signals over and over to your body that you need that type of uh, energy and you should hold on to calories. And, and that exact same dynamic, that exact same metabolic profile is associated with heart disease, right? So um, we make, essentially, we make adaptations that make sense in the short run that are adaptive in the short run that cost us in the long run. Um, this is true for physical health and obesity is one of the simplest ways to think about this, but it's also true for the way we process information, for the way we handle relationships, the way we think about um, you know, investments of time. Uh, there are lots of things that we do, lots of decisions we make when the environment is scarce, 
that have um, short-term adaptations and long-term costs for us. Um, it is also the case that stressful experiences can impair cognitive functioning. So um, they really change what you remember and what you attend to. So the more stress and trauma you experience, the more you pay attention and watch for uh, places where threat might come and, and orient your attention that way. Um, it is a small walk to go from having a lot of orientation and focus on threat in the environment to having depression, anxiety, or the propensity to act out or hurt others. Um, so uh, the easiest way to think about this for me is that um, is to really think about what the difference is between fear and anxiety. So fear is primarily about a credible threat. It is a full physiologic behavioral response to something uh, that is a credible threat in your environment, something that could hurt you. Um, anxiety is a lot of the same physiologic and cognitive uh, profiles, but it is, it is uh, elicited by either something nonspecific, right? So you just feel anxious or by something that most people would not see as a credible threat. Um, so for example, having a fear of elevators, um, most people would not think um, that elevators pose a particularly strong set of risks. Um, but maybe you're somebody who's had some pretty rough uh, times trapped in an elevator, right? That could be your experience. And so how do we get people over an anxiety? We have them ride the elevator a lot of times, right? Until eventually it, we de decouple this association that something bad is going to happen in that environment. Well, let's say, so, so that's, you know, that's a good way to treat anxiety. We understand how to treat anxiety. But let's say that your anxieties are built up from your, your credible experience, right? Like, your actual life has been a series of very unpredictable um, threats coming from lots of different environments, right? Then the, the line between fear and anxiety there is, is really blurry. Um, and what is adaptive? What is smart? And what puts you in a place where your ability to function is compromised is actually a pretty narrow line. And so helping people walk through those things and respond appropriately, either with the right degree of engagement, because of course you've all had the experience of working with families who have withdrawn so much, right? They, they won't engage for their own um, positive change because the whole thing just is untenable. Um, not, uh, not that, we don't want that full withdrawal, but also this overactive, this hypervigilance, this hyperreactivity to, to things that happen um, that are lower grade makes it harder to invest any resources in something that is that is longer grade. And I actually think that COVID will be a very, um, a very fascinating, um, the next stage of COVID is going to be very interesting because COVID on the one hand has been an absolutely credible threat, right? Um, uh, the number of, the sheer number of people who have died, the sheer number of people who've been hospitalized or had significant uh, severe illness, right? Is enormous, but we are going to cross that line. We are going to vaccinate enough people. You can already see it happening. We're going to vaccinate enough people that the chance of hospitalization or death is going to go way down. Um, but the chance of getting COVID is still going to be there, right? So we'll have to, all of us, will have to recalibrate um, and think about uh, this relative risk. Um, and I talk to my colleagues about this all the time. I'm the COVID coordinator for the university here. And, you know, we're planning fall and uh, return and fall. And of course, some people are very nervous about that. And I have taken to saying it is already at this moment more dangerous to drive to my campus than to be on it. Um, but it it doesn't matter because we have we have focused our attention so much on this credible threat. So being able to take something that is a credible threat and then adjust, adapt when the world changes, when the when the degree of danger changes, to something that is more manageable. That is actually very hard to do cognitively, physiologically, very hard to do. And so when we're expecting families to behave in a particular way, because we don't see a particular situation as threatening in the way that they do, um, it's important to take that perspective, to try to take that perspective and think, okay, what has your prior experience taught you about what this might mean for you, right? What, how this might impact you. So if you can imagine that threshold of taking whenever it's going to come of, of deciding that it's that it's okay, right? It's relatively okay to be around other people um, because the hospitalization and death rate has come down enough. Like 
when will you hit that threshold? When will other people hit that threshold? How will your personal experience of COVID impact when you hit that threshold? What about the people who never would follow along or do anything in the first place, um, never wanted to wear a mask, never wanted to change their behavior in the first place? How did they get to that point of feeling like it doesn't matter, right? So all of those, uh, no agency, no individual agency over it or, or a sense of, um, of invulnerability as an individual, right? That nothing could happen to you as an individual. So how do those things happen? It's not a mystery how those things happen. We have a lot of science to understand how people make sense of their environments and what that does for how they, how they react. Okay, and then the last thing um, that we have learned is that stress and uh, trauma dramatically accelerate aging. Um, this last fact has been a primary motivator for many people to be engaged in this work. Um, being in a stressful environment literally takes um, a lot of time off your life. And we know some also about how it happens. So let's talk about life expectancy for a minute. So life expectancy is the age that you are expected to live to based on the year of your birth. So and the place of your birth and sometimes uh, uh, gender and sometimes race are included in those. So there is an estimate placed on a baby um, about what their expe expected life uh, is. So you can look up your own life expectancy by looking up the year of your birth. Um, and then there are a number of factors that can change that life expectancy, that individual life expectancy, right? So if your life expectancy was uh, 78 and you're a lifelong smoker, you're looking to take 10 years off, um, off that life expectancy. Um, and same thing, we know, we know these are risk factors, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, all, all of these take between five and 10 years off your total life expectancy. Um, the one that really got a lot of attention is the fact that severe stress in childhood can take up to 10 years off your individual life expectancy. So again, if you were expected to live to be 78 and you have a, a a very difficult, very uh, traumatic childhood, um, your life expectancy can go down to 58. Uh, so 20 years um, gone. And that life expectancy reduction has an impact not just for that individual, but for that individual's family and for that individual's community. Um, if everyone's life ended at 58 instead of 78, um, there are so many uh, systemic impacts that would have on all of us. Um, uh, economic impacts, um, you know, the the change in the in the experience of having a grandparent, and would that, if your life expectancy was fifty eight, would that uh, accelerate your child uh, your child bearing timeline? It sure would, right? Like if humans only lived to fifty eight, and if you look back in time to when humans only did live to fifty eight, people would start childbearing earlier. Okay, so. I didn't have my first kiddo until I was 40. Would I do that if I was gonna to live to 58? If I thought I was gonna to live to 58? Probably not. That's a pretty big gamble there, right? Um, all right, so this, this last piece, this piece of understanding how much, uh, how much of an impact stress can have and exactly how it can happen. So we know some about what changes in the body, um, what happens to the brain, um, has really focused a lot of attention on prevention and trying to get ahead of this because it's difficult to remediate it after it's already happened. Um, this is a risk factor that's in place by the time somebody is 18. And it doesn't mean that you can't change it. Um, in fact, it means that it's even more important that you do try. Um, I'm often asked that question, like, when is it too late to intervene? And I think, you know, a 98 year old should put out a cigarette and go for a walk. Like, you know, I think it always matters um, what, uh, what you do, how you choose to engage, what, you ch what protective behaviors you choose, to, you choose to have, how you make meaning in the life that you're in. I think it always matters. But having, um, having this kind of start is, is definitely a significant hurdle to, to face. Um, okay, so back trying to integrate now the biology um, and the economics. So you've maybe seen um, some version of this basic uh, graph here, which is that um, by age three, we see pretty significant differences in um, this, in this particular case, it's total gray matter, which is the um, neuronal density in the brain. Um, pretty significant differences that are not present at birth, but are present by three years of age in, in total gray matter as a function of 
socioeconomic uh, position. So um, that's a composition of income and education. Uh, so you start to see those differences. If you've seen the 30 million word gap uh, graph, it looks identical to this. So that's um, the 30 million word gap is the difference in the number of words kids hear by age three, depending on um, their family's socioeconomic position, um, where kids hear a lot more words when they're in families with higher income and more education um, in that first few years of life, a lot more words directed at them, um, a lot more words than this. You can do this with recordings that sub substitute out uh, television and radio. So it's literally spoken to the child. Pretty modifiable thing to do. Um, I don't know if you guys use the Lena device where you are, but um, that's an intervention tool where you literally put a Lena device on. It's essentially a recorder uh, on a kiddo. And then you work with the family to say, hey, this is how many words um, you know, kids should be hearing by about this age. And you know, can we think about some ways to help help you interact more with, with this kiddo, which again is another culturally uh, driven thing, right? Like how culturally typical or atypical is it to talk to a baby, to read to a baby? Um, it used to be pretty culturally atypical to do that. Um, even when my kids were, were babies and I would walk around in the grocery store talking to them, people sometimes would give me a look, you know? Um, and, and, you know, I do it to my dog too, because you never know. Um, so just lots of, uh, lots of uh, chit chatter about what's happening in the world. Um, but then, you know, you can, you can hear it in the way they talk, right? They're, they're just learning machines like we all are. Um, and then um, I think another thing I like to think about in terms of uh, thinking about big picture um, uh, changes that are possible. So um, this, this study got a ton of press. This is about a whole, whole brain cortical um, uh, volume and family income. And essentially this is from three to, uh, this is all the way across shot, but um, I think the top of my, um, whoops, the top of my paper is a little covered up on my screen. I don't know if it is on yours, but. Um, essentially, this is it. This is the, the figure from the paper, and the headlines were all about how higher income um, results in uh, larger brain volume. And so, when I saw the headlines, I thought, "Well, shoot! Like, are there people walking around with these like really big, heavy brains? You know, like what is what is this linear association, which makes it sound like the more income you have, the bigger your brain is?" So I pulled the paper to take a look at it, and, and there is a linear association. So that's what that line means. It's a little, little higher on the right than it is on the left. Um, but what you can actually see, I think, in this paper is this dramatic increase in brain volume, uh, this little curve at the front end. Um, really, all the action here is between 0 and 50K. Uh, so, so 50K is not that high for a family income, if you think about, uh, if you think about it. Um, and a lot of action happening in brain growth in that, in that span. So when we think about uh, trying to support families to, to economic stability, um, that number is not that far off actually, um, what you see in a lot of areas for um, a proportion of the federal poverty line where you start to see some, some differences kick in. Now we have some really interesting policies happening right now, for example, uh, the changes in the minimum wage. Um, and changes in minimum wage are great, but changes in minimum wage that come without infusions of cash and come without a plan um, for handling things like the loss of benefits can actually hurt families quite a bit, so benefit cliff. Um, so just trying to think about what does it look like to help families move to a place where, I mean, if it really is, if it, if it really is the case that if you make it to 50K, you know, you're you're going to build a brain that that functionally has you know all of all of the things it needs, and then there'll be individual variability from there. If that were actually the the case, um, then that's a very targetable um, outcome to try to achieve collectively, right? Like, how do we get families to to a universal uh, basic income that is sustainable? Um, uh, we don't know that that's definitively the case, of course, um, but there is some converging evidence that. There's a tipping point. It's not an absolute thing where every, you know, it's just more, 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 more that everybody has to have, but maybe that there's some, some minimum place we can get to to support healthy development for everyone. Um, so the the 20 year lifespan reduction thing I told you before comes from the ACEs study, which you probably all heard of, um, adverse childhood experiences study, which is a huge study that was done in Southern California initially with over 17,000 um, Kaiser patients. And they basically asked them about things that might've happened in the first 18 years of life and then followed their medical records across time. 
um, and, and showed a huge number of connections between that adverse experience, the number of adversities in early childhood and up to the age of 18, um, and uh, all kinds of outcomes down the road. Um, that original study, of course, has been replicated in most states um, and is part of the behavioral risk factor surveillance system now, uh, so we can track that. So knowing at a broad level that um, adverse experiences have these very significant impacts for how, how we grow and develop um, does have, of course, natural implications for what that means we prioritize um, in early childhood. So um, as I mentioned before, we understand some of how stress literally takes a toll on the body. Um, essentially, it accelerates, it literally accelerates aging. So that left top left there, um, that's a chromosome, that pink and green guy, that's a chromosome. Um, the pink part is the coding DNA. That's the part of, um, you know, where all the protein and building instructions are inside your body. And then the green caps are uh, the telomeres. And so those are essentially protective. They're, they're there to keep the coding DNA from, from unraveling, right? From, and, and every time a cell is uh, copied, which happens, of course, all across your lifespan, um, all your chromosomes are copied over and a little bit of that um, telomere is chopped off. A little bit of that green part is chopped off. And then across your life, um, those telomeres shorten and that particular cell, uh, when those telomeres are gone, you know, that the structural integrity of that, of that cell is no good. And so that cell will, will die off. And when that starts to happen all over your body, then you're starting to talk about overall senescence. So overall, you're you're getting uh, near the end of your life. So we can measure the length of those telomeres, that green bit, um, and get a, a number, uh, which is your functional age as compared to your chronologic age. Um, so if you imagine what your chronologic age right now is, and then think about, do you feel like you're older or younger than your chronologic age? Most people don't feel spot on the exact age they are. Um, we could actually measure that if we were in person, I could, I could uh, take some samples from you and it's actually not difficult to do. And uh, we get a read on a given day, right? What is your functional age compared to your chronologic age? But I think another really important piece of this is that is also modifiable. So let's say you had this really difficult childhood. You have a really high A score. Uh, you're on this 20 year lifespan reduction trajectory. There are things you can do to literally regrow those green things, um, literally regrow your telomeres and protect your chromosomes. Um, and I don't know if the chat, does the chat work while we're in here? I don't know if it does, um, but maybe you can, it does. Okay, so think to yourself, what are some things that you could do um, to regrow those telomeres? Does anyone have an idea that can pop in the chat? Yep, exercise, that's a key one. Yep, yep, food counseling. <laughs> Nice, great list. You're forgetting one big one. I know it's coming, I'm gonna be patient. Starts with an M. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness, so being in, in the moment, um, meditation or mindfulness is another really key one that has actually been shown to work. Great, you guys are great at this, good job. Um, so, and yet we tend to, right? When we're stressed, we tend to do fewer of these protective important behaviors, right? We're more likely to reach for unhealthy food. We're less likely to sleep well. Uh, we're less likely to make time for friends and family. Um, we're less likely to exercise. Um, and it can become, uh, it can really spin out really, really quickly. And I think, I think uh, COVID has made that really clear to, to most people. So. Um, making time for these things uh, literally makes time, literally actually makes time in your life that you can then share and give and be and be present for others. Thank you for the great suggestions. And it's nice to know you're there. It's very weird talking to a screen. <laughs> All right, so um, we're just gonna carry on here. So beginning in the womb, um, babies start to track their environment for, um, for signals about what the world is like. Um, we know a lot about that actually. They start to learn, they can hear, um, and they're taking all kinds of signals from their uh, uh, hormonal and nutritional environment um, in the womb. So we have uh, um, some examples of the way this goes well, um, learning, early learning and positive things that can happen and some examples of things that can be difficult. 
So uh, this is a study by my colleague Alicia Davis. Um, this is a longitudinal study they did where they uh, looked at stress during pregnancy. So they asked um, parent moms to track their stress uh, across their pregnancy, and they took uh, stress hormone measurements from them across pregnancy. And then right away when babies were born, um, they ran, ran over to the hospital to be there when the babies had their heel stick blood draw. Heel stick blood draw is a medically necessary and aversive procedure, so babies do not like it. Um, and it actually is painful and it takes a few minutes typically to do. So um, what you see here on the left hand of the chart is that all of the babies, the green and the yellow line, all of the babies got mad when their heel, heel got uh, poked um, and squeezed. Um, this particular measure is uh, their behavioral state, but they also measure the infant stress hormones. Um, but then right about just a little after one minute, um, you start to see a differentiation in how the babies responded that has to do with the stress uh, levels of their mom during pregnancy. So moms who had lower prenatal uh, stress hormones, um, particularly early in pregnancy, those babies went basically right down to baseline. So if you see this original green dot uh, all the way to the left, you can see they're basically back down there um, by about two minutes of um, after the heel stick blood draw. Whereas the babies who had already experienced these higher <coughs> stress hormone levels during pregnancy, um, early in pregnancy, maintained a level of distress and vigilance um, out as long as the researchers watched, so out to six minutes. Um, so what that tells us is whatever the reason for it is, whatever the origin is, could be a combination of environmental and genetic factors. Right away at birth, the way the baby is responding to a threat differs. Um, where some babies are reacting much more to that threatening situation than other babies are. Um, and they followed these kiddos. They actually are um, adults now. They're early adults now and they are still following them. But um, in, the, in the childhood period, they saw that um, the, this, the same thing, so kids who had had that experience of high stress hormones early in pregnancy also were more likely to be anxious and depressed in in childhood, so this is six to eight years of age, um, and the girls were more likely to have larger right amygdala volumes. So the amygdala is a part of the brain that helps you detect threat in the environment. Um, and that is, uh, it makes sense. It's all kind of telling the same story, right? So whether it's um, that early experience in the womb or also some genetic factors, kids differ in the way they respond to their environment right away at birth. And we see some consistency in that response uh, across childhood that makes them more responsive uh, to threats that they that they perceive. Um, and this is another, uh, so, so that's one of the studies, um, you know, in the past 20 years that's had a huge impact on the way I think about things, um, which is just how early we see differences in the way, um, in the way babies respond to their environment and how those uh, signals that they're getting in the womb are already contributing to the way that they, the way that they react to the world. Um, and this paper also uh, similarly had a huge impact on me, which is um, basically what they did in this paper is they had, uh, they wanted to look at infant brains. So um, in order to do that, they needed to um, uh, have babies be sleeping because it's hard to put them in a magnet and look at their brain while they're awake because they won't stay still for you. Um, because they had sleeping babies, uh, they had to think creatively about what to, what to have them do in the magnet. And so they had them listen uh, just listen to some adult voices. So they listen to angry and neutral adult voices. They also asked parents how much fighting was going on at home. And basically what they found is that the more fighting that was going on at home, the more responsive infants' brains were to angry versus neutral adult voices while they were asleep. So um, this had a huge impact on me because I had really no awareness before this that sleeping babies were tracking their environment for danger. Um, we know that adult voices um, are a really good signal for whether threat is coming in the environment. We know that children with maltreatment histories are very fast to notice when adults go from neutral to negative um, and to respond appropriately because that's probably a really protective behavior for them uh, to have. Um, but the fact that babies are doing that while they're asleep um, and that that differs depending on their experience, and that was a, a definitely eye-opening um, moment for me. And I think an important one because I think many people, many people think there are, um, you know, there's times when negative conflict is is not as big of a deal, um, and so conflict management strategies are really really critical. 
um, not having, um, not solving problems with with anger and yelling and and, and hurting um, matters for your kiddos, even even when they're sleeping, which is just uh, just pretty crazy. So trying to figure out some way to to deal with our difficult emotions and our frustration that doesn't involve um, doesn't involve that uh, yelling and and other types of responding um, really probably has some pay forward uh, consequences. But uh, uh, you know submerging feelings uh, suppression is terrible for health, right? So just not handling it, just pushing it down, that's not a good way. Um, to move forward either. We really need a set of adaptive strategies to handle stressful experiences. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to do overall is help you think about, um, think about why people might behave in a particular way every time you're in a situation where you're trying to change the behavior of an individual person or family is to stop and think, um, is, this, is this really uh, something that's gone, that's, that's, that makes no sense? Does it make no sense? Or can you make sense of it? Can you understand how this person might have gotten to this place? And then think about how you might unwind that um, versus taking the, the easier road, which is to think you have no idea how somebody could be a monster. You have no idea how somebody could have that opinion or that perspective or, or that behavior, it makes no sense. Um, if you get stuck in that space, it's very hard to design an effective connection. Um, and it really is, um, rarely true in my experience that if you really try, you can't understand how somebody came um, to the situation and place that they're in. So for example, we tend to uh, hear, you hear people say that individuals with adversity histories act irrationally and against their own best interests, right? Um, so sometimes trauma informed will say something, have some you know, functional piece to it, like, um, well, don't expect people to make you know, good, um, rational long-term decisions. Um, so, so you could take that, you could take that perspective or you could try to think about what the decision that they've made is. So um, my favorite example of this is the marshmallow task, which I think you guys are probably all familiar with, but it is essentially a task where a young child is um, taken into a room by a stranger, uh, young, typically a young female stranger that they don't know she says, you can have this marshmallow now, or if you wait until I come back, you can have two. And then she goes out and we film the kiddo trying to handle that situation, right? Um, and you measure how long, um, how long it takes before they eat the marshmallow. And there's very funny, cute videos on the internet about this. Um, and the derivative measure called delay of gratification uh, and the subsequent um, implications of that uh, have been used very, very widely. Um, so there are differences in kids' abilities to delay gratification, that is wait for the second marshmallow, um, that are thought to have you know, connections to how they do in school um, and in life. Um, and not surprisingly, you see pretty big differences in how uh, kids handle this task when they have had um, more adversity and less consistent uh, resources. So, okay, so we could say, all right, so we know this child has poor delay of gratification, it's gonna have these consequences for schooling, blah, blah, blah. Um, we need to try to teach them better delay of gratification. Um, or we need to teach some other executive function skills uh, to try to get through this. But, but I think there is an assumption of a deficit. There's an assumption of a deficit in that model. Um, and I, I have actually done the marshmallow task on many kids. Um, and the thing is like, if your life has been relatively unpredictable, right? And adults have not always been able to give you things even when they want to. And a stranger, a strange woman that you don't know gives you some proposition, right? About not eating this marshmallow and waiting for the second one. Like what fool doesn't eat the marshmallow? You know, like that is not irrational behavior. It is rational behavior in the context of an unpredictable environment. Why in fact, should you believe this completely random stranger is gonna come back with another marshmallow? I mean, that doesn't sound that believable, right? And so to take from that, to take from that behavior, that behavioral choice and extrapolate that the child does not have delay of gratification, that the child does not understand, does not have executive function, does not have control over the way they handle things, I think is an extrapolation that is unfair. Um, I, I do think that that behavior tells you a lot about their environment. And I think it tells you a lot about what you would need to do to change their behavior. So if you want a child to hang around 
and delay gratification, then you have to make the environment consistent enough that they believe you. You have to make it stable enough, right? That they have the ability to wait for another round. You have to make the conditions you have. And, and, you know, we, we sometimes talk with families about like, don't make promises you can't keep, make promises, just make teeny, teeny, tiny ones, little tiny ones and show that you can be consistent and reliable and trusted and do not promise things you cannot deliver on because we all build expectations from the way the world works. Um, so there's lots of other examples. That's my favorite one. You know, watching for threat, having a bias towards seeing it versus missing it is a really smart thing to do if your environment is threatening. Accelerating maturation, we already talked about this. If you're only gonna live to 58, should you wait till 40 to have kids? Probably not, right? Um, stay vigilant, maximize short-term gain and minimize long-term delayed return investment, right? So try to get the most uh, hourly wage you can right now. Don't um, get paid less so that you can go into a training program or, or a longer educational program if you don't think you're gonna be around to reap the benefits of that. Um, all of these types of factors are very, very important um, to consider. So uh, just trying to give a frame around whether we consider a behavior rational or irrational and what that does for what we do. Um, there's also a theoretical perspective on this. Um, uh, this is an interesting, an interesting paper on the developmental adaptation to stress. So I'll just read you this quote. Thus, from an evolutionary developmental perspective, stressful rearing conditions, even if those conditions engender sustained stress responses that must be maintained over time should not so much impair neurobiologic, neuro, neurobiologic systems as direct or regulate them toward patterns of functioning that are adaptive under stressful conditions. So if the, if the adaptation is to a stressful environment and you wanna change that environment, you wanna change that outcome, you have to think about the whole system and how the individual functions in that and not just drop the child into a different environment and expect them expect their behavior to make sense. And of course, we all know this from thinking about the context of foster care, foster care literature, you know, re kids repeat, uh, repeat placement kids. Um, we know it from that kind of behavioral standpoint, but rebuilding, retraining a brain to expect consistency, to expect that investment is gonna make a difference. That's a pretty big, that's a pretty big task. So um, we can adapt environments to maximize the utilities of the skills and traits developed under conditions of adversity, right? Um, in fact, you can think about, so uh, the underlying um, uh, genes that predispose for attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder are also very common in people who have migrated further from their, from their origin. Um, so there are ways in which you can make the skills that people have function well in their environment, right? And, and ways in which sitting in a chair in school is not all day long or at home in the middle of homeschooling is not a good fit for everybody's uh, skill set. And then if you need to, if you truly want to rewire the person, if you need to um, think about approaching them as rational and working with them to change the value proposition of their behavior. So what is the consequence of the behavior that they, they engage in and how can you incentivize or reward the outcome that you want um, versus, versus punish um, uh, uh, versus a punishment orientation. All right. Um, so we got to figure out which kiddos we're talking about. We have a hard time with that sometimes. Um, there are the kids with presenting issues, which is a small number. Um, there's the referred and reported. And of course, you guys know how how problematic that is. And then there are all the other kids that never come to our attention. And we know this is true because the, um, for many reasons, but the ACE study, actually all of those health consequences, those long-term health consequences, that was a sample of, of folks largely not captured for having um, adverse experiences in childhood. So we did not know about it until they were adults and they were in this study and started to have these negative outcomes. Um, so a public health solution uh, to a problem is, is, is something that we have actually pretty good track record with. Um, we are right now engaged in a mass vaccination campaign like nothing we have ever seen, right? We are vaccinating millions of people. Um, we are doing it with a vaccine that did not even exist to a disease that didn't exist. Um, and we have stood up and gotten a sure lot of people to contribute um, to this big effort. When we are properly motivated, humans properly motivated, we are pretty good at public health solutions. Um, things that you would have previously thought not possible um, to do are things that we routinely do. Um, 
another good example is uh, lead. Um, so lead was in paint and in gasoline and everywhere. And we determined that that was really dangerous for kiddos, right? And so um, we enacted government business policy and personal um, behavioral changes to get that paint off the wall and out of the gasoline and rebuild the engines to work more efficiently um, and all of the things that had to happen. So a public health solution is difficult and it takes a huge investment, but it is possible to do it when you have the right information. And I think um, understanding the consequences uh, of sy the systemic strains on families and the results on kids and the consequences to all of us for that could and should be viewed as a public health problem. Um, so now we've got this frame though, where we're all focused on COVID-19 and how might we um, actually take advantage of this very difficult time to make uh, progress in terms of understanding uh, what families, children and families need. Um, so starting by believing in change, um, trying to understand that uh, a lack of an expectation that a family can change is one of the, one of the things that is most, uh, a biggest, one of our biggest barriers. So it's our inability to see that other people can change and it is their own internal ability to see that they can change. Um, making change also just requires starting somewhere, right? Starting to untangle that crazy string. Um, working with families, working with people to change whatever thing it is they want to change first, not the thing you want them to change first, right? Um, it isn't so much that you have to start at the bottom step like that little girl is doing. You have to start somewhere and untangle that string. Um, and where a person might want to start might be different than what you think. Um, this is a very, very complicated figure, and it actually, I have a very simple thing I want to tell you about it, which is that we tend to assume, because the poverty rate is stable in the U.S., that the same families are poor um, across time, and that is actually not the case. Um, there are families that are stuck, generational uh, situations where people are stuck in poverty, but it is relatively uncommon. In fact, at a snapshot in time, most families that are experiencing low income and subsequent consequences of it will change their circumstances with existing supports. So uh, what this is, is data from four big national studies. It's uh, uh, almost 20,000 kids. Um, the studies were not collected for the purpose of looking at, at these factors, but basically what we did is we grouped, we, we allowed the data to be mathematically grouped um, and it generated three groups of families. Uh, those in relatively low risk conditions with high income and uh, good maternal education and then two higher risk groups, one that was 9% uh, of the total population um, and experiencing lots of instability in addition to low income. So housing instability, food insecurity, that kind of thing. And then a big group, 47% that were high risk in terms of income and education, but lower in instability. So good, secure housing, uh, not food insecurity. And essentially what we saw is that uh, two years later when the kiddos were three, so that was the initial three to at age one, most families have changed their circumstances. So um, the high-risk families, those 44%, almost all of them are, continue to be in low-risk families. That's good, we have these people. Um, the lower instability group, that was 47. Now 87% of those families are in lower-risk conditions, primarily driven by increases in maternal education um, and also in income. And then that 9% group, even those, even those, over half of those families have improved their circumstances. But those that have not, those are the ones we really we really drill into. And it's that instability piece that was so important here. Um, and instability is something that we can definitely tackle with policies and, and programs, right? Trying to, trying to decrease housing instability, um, changes in schools, changes in caregivers, changes in um, uh, ability uh, to have uh, food and basic resources. All right. I've been working on trying to figure out which kids, and I'm interested in their, their internal stress physiology. So this is something I've been working on. Um, this is what your stress physiology looks like on a normal day. Um, high in the morning, nice strong decrease, and then a, a flattening pattern across the day. Same thing in kiddos. So these are kids' patterns. That flat you see in the in the top left graph is just napping. Um, but then we see um, when people have PTSD, they show this um, much attenuated, this flattened pattern, and um, their body is pulled in, withdrawn, pulled in, and unresponsive. Uh, the, their stress physiology, which has lots of consequences. So we were interested in whether we would see the same kind of behavior in kids, and in fact, we do. Um, so these are little, little guys. Um, we see um, a very flat, attenuated pattern um, in infants and toddlers in high adversity conditions. And this was the first time that we saw this in, in kids this small. 
Um, so it is an indication that we have um, already a, an adaptation of the body in response to stress that could be really problematic for the, the life force. Um, so I'm interested in, uh, this is a, a startup company I have. We're interested in just routinely screening for stress hormones in kiddos so that we catch those kids, even if they're in that bottom part of the, of the pyramid where they're not being referred or reported and they're not presenting symptoms. Um, we also know that it really matters what parents do um, for this kind of uh, buffering, this stress physiology um, piece. And what you see here is this is data from my lab too, where we um, stressed kids out deliberately. So we put them through a number of um, aversive tasks and we had um, they were there with their uh, primary caregiver. And what you can see is that um, when the primary caregiver <clears throat> exhibited strong positive parenting uh, skills, the, the child didn't respond physiologically to the stressors that we presented, whereas the orange line shows you that the kids whose parents were not able to provide that type of buffering um, took on all of those stress responses themselves. So it's kind of like those that infant study I showed you with the newborns responding to the heel stick blood draw. If you don't, if you can't lean on the adult that you're with, then you take those costs in your own body and taking those costs in your own body have consequences across time. And that's how we essentially believe you end up with a 20 year lifespan reduction. It's the accumulation of this adversity across time inside your body. Um, so lots of things we can look at for promotive factors. Um, we tend to focus on the people who have more negative experiences. So this is the lifetime prevalence of depression by ACE score. If you have five or more uh, ACEs, uh, six and 10 people um, end up with depression in the lifespan. But it is actually really interesting to think about these four people, what protective factors were at play, how can we enhance those? Because often um, the adversities have already happened by the time we learn about them. And what we're talking about is how to promote or um, heal and move forward from where we are. Um, remembering that resilience is really a better than expected outcome, giving an assessment of risk. So that means if we can increase the resources that we put at the, on the table, um, we sometimes can, can even the playing field. And resilience is not a rose growing alone in the desert. That is not actually scientifically what it means. It is literally um, better than expected outcomes given an assessment of risk that can often be accounted for by a careful categorization of resources, most particularly human resources. Um, highly recommend using the BSIS whenever you use the ACEs, which is to understand uh, what kind of protective factors are at play. So did you have at least one caregiver with whom you felt safe? Do you have at least one good friend? Um, this is a, a freely available measure. And um, I generally would never ask the ACE uh, inventory without asking the BSIS as well. Um, looking for what we see behaviorally in resilient parents. These are some things that I see, but I'm really interested in the things that you see. Um, what builds resilience? What does it look like, right? Having um, flexibility for closed door after closed door after closed door. Um, being generous and helping others is something we see a lot. It is not the case that people who have more give more. Um, it is in fact the case that often people who have less give the most. Um, and people who are resilient are often very generous. And then I have a couple of programs that I've developed to try to build, um, uh, move beyond trauma-informed and help people think about their skill set, um, not really. It's just a different measure. The difference between pieces and uh, uh, protective, um, they're just different inventories. They're very similar. I like the pieces, but you can use whichever one works for you. Um, I develop seedlings for parents, which is essentially a way for parents to learn the information, some of the information I just shared with you, other types of information about how stress impacts uh, the brain and body, but to do it in the context of understanding their own history and to do it in the context of building identifying, building, and supporting their own, um, their own uh, skills for managing stress. So it is a 10-week um, curriculum for parents, and it's uh, been uh, pretty um, impactful at trying to break this history of toxic stress, the intergenerational transmission of it. Um, so we just start by identifying parenting goals. It's only for the adult. It's not a parenting intervention. Help process experience trauma, build social connections, build knowledge build self-care skills and make commitments um, moving forward. So it's been, it's been a great way to engage with parents around these concepts. Um, it's a very uh, heavily science-based um, program and it's attempts to give scientific knowledge directly to parents so they can make their own decisions. It does not advocate for a particular strategy um, with respect to parenting. Um, and we do talk about a lot of the different uh, stress management and self-care skills. So uh, sleep, exercise, mindfulness, nutrition, the ones you generated that, and that uh, regrow telomeres, making sure not to leave those off. Behavioral strategies like engaging and connecting, problem solving, making changes and working toward goals. 
Um, and then mental strategies like mindset, ex uh, acceptance, reappraisal, visualization, and mental distancing, all of which can be really, really helpful. I think of those as the Gandhi strategies, the ones you can do uh, in any context, no matter what the world brings at you. And um, Roots is our, uh, now not our newest, but it's one of our newer um, programs. It's essentially an intensive workshop experience for direct service providers um, to do some of the same kind of work. So it's about doing the work for yourself, um, about your own growth. Um, alongside uh, learning knowledge, it's really about uh, promoting um, well-being and, and change within ourselves and each other. And uh, here's our takeaways for the day. So inequities are severe and they matter a lot on average, um, but it is actually the case that people change, brains change, um, and inequity and adversity are not inevitable. Um, I absolutely hate the phrase social determinants of health because I find them to be neither social nor deterministic. Um, the things that impact health so much, like our zip code, those are structural inequities that we have built and we can unbuild, and they are not deterministic. Um, we all have agency over our own, our own futures, and we certainly have agencies over, oh, agency over our collective outcomes. Um, adaptations that people make are rational. They adapt to the environment to suit what it is. If you want to change the way people behave and think about changing the value proposition of the behavior they have expressed, um, resilience can be understood biologically, behaviorally, experientially. If we really focus on understanding it better, we can promote it better. Um, and supporting children and the adults in their lives together. So really thinking about that ecological systems uh, approach can be uh, transformative and multiplicative um, moving forward in time. And a public health approach makes sense, but it's going to need new tools. But I know we can do it because we just did it for a disease we never heard of. And lots of people and money and stuff to do that uh, fussy uh, research. And thank you all for your attention and all of the uh, all of the um, great work that you do. And I wish we had time to interact more. I don't know how to how to make that happen in this context. Wow, <laughs> that is so much information. That is incredible. <laughs> thank you. I'm like I was like, and you and then pounded in a whole bunch of stuff at the end. I was like, wow, we're <laughs> I'm sure we could have gone another. Uh, half hour but yeah time is not our friend that is the way these things go <laughs> so so everybody thank you sarah for you know we, we, we would be we would be clapping we would be clapping in another uh environment it's sort of hard to do it in this one i suppose nicole yeah. has up her uh clapping hand we can do those reactions that's good uh, <laughs> we can do those things but uh it just never feels the same, right? <laughs> Nobody laughs at our funny things. I know it's very oh, weird. Yeah. I can't, I can't see your faces. So it's yeah, but uh, I think everyone's. <laughs> I'm getting excellent, amazing, wowza, wow, thank you, uh, very great information. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, great information. I think people. I don't know. I don't know if you can make any of this available. To yeah, folks. you're welcome to share. You're welcome to share the slides for sure. Okay, and, and the and your uh, talk will be up on a YouTube channel after a few days, so sure. we will. So that will be available. And I know people have asked about resources and publications and various things. So I suppose that will all show up, you know, as we go through that. But goodness, so much amazing stuff. Hopefully, people found it both. Uh, challenging and uh, you know hopefully uh, some things that you might be able to bring into your work which is of course the point of point of understanding this but sometimes we don't really have the time to be aware of you know journal articles and science and all of these things that you know really do inform our work but we are sometimes have to be slow to get there because it takes so much time for that information to seep into our daily work so there's so there's so many questions in the chat I don't know what to do I do okay I'm going to recommend one. Okay. And because unfortunately, we already have another thing supposed to be starting. So I'm like, okay, we got to, we got to do it. Um, I don't know, Sarah, if people come up with questions that we could send to you and there are things that you might want to, you know, answer on, you know, later, uh, we can, we will have the chat for a while. So we'll be able to do that. And maybe we can, um, uh, send you some questions and you said uh, you said you in or you can go to Sarah directly at sarah.watamora at du.edu edu yeah du.edu so um yeah I know there's such amazing things and a lot of things to read about 